All right, we're going to move right on to uh, valve surgery uh, discussions. And um, some of you saw uh, we, we took a little journey through the heart, I guess. Did everybody get the, the um, anatomy wet lab yesterday? So I guess you all know everything about the aortic valve and the mitral valve, so we don't have to talk about the anatomy too much. Um, but again, you can, this kind of shows the proximity here between the mitral valve and the aortic valve. And uh, we talked about the orient orientation uh, at length yesterday. Um, a couple of things to point out. We, we talked several times about where the bundle, the bundle branch and the bundle of hiss and the AV node. So you can see here, here's a, uh, again, we talked a lot about the triangle of coke and the, uh, where the tricuspid valve is. And this is where uh, the bundle runs. It, it's not green like that in real life, but um, uh, if you know where it is, you're, you're less apt to injure it. So that, that's why we uh, harped on that quite a bit. Uh, this doesn't show it real well. M this uh, MRI, um, some, a lot of times we operate on hearts that actually beat like this. Uh, so this, uh, <laughs> this shows you the uh, physiology of uh, systole and diastole or uh, cardiac standstill. Uh, that's not going to do us much good. So there's a lot of uh, things that cause aortic insufficiency. And th these are a couple of, uh, a couple of the uh, typical etiologies. Uh, the things we see most commonly are, are uh, uh, degenerative diseases, bicuspid valves. Um, we don't see rheumatic heart disease here as much anymore, but we still see it quite a bit because uh, mostly with uh, immigration and with patients who uh, had rheumatic fever 20 to 40 years ago and now are showing the signs of uh, rheumatic heart disease. But it's not quite as common anymore. Um, but all these uh, other causes you see up here are uh, important contributors to aortic insufficiency. So the symptoms patients get if they have, aortic, if they have uh, severe aortic insufficiency, they can be completely asymptomatic. And a lot of times they're asymptomatic for 10 or 15 years uh, before symptoms come on, even if they have severe AI. Uh, patients can get palpitations, they can get tachycardia, they can get the sensation of their pulse because uh, the, um, they're uh, volume overloaded and, and have a, a high, uh, a wide pulse pressure, so they get the water hammer pulse or the sensation of their pulse. Uh, they can have atypical chest pains and uh, ultimately progress to heart failure type symptoms. The indications for operation when you have aortic insufficiency, uh, if you have acute aortic regurgitation that's severe, uh, you need an early operation because uh, the heart hasn't, comp hasn't uh, developed a comp uh, compensatory dilatation yet and severe acute AI is, uh, is deadly very quickly. If you have uh, symptomatic severe chronic AI, uh, if you, once you have symptoms, that's, the in that's an indication to operate. Um, if you have asymptomatic severe chronic AI, you want to operate before you develop uh, signs of LV failure or any, any evidence that your LV is, uh, is, is struggling. So if you get worsening LV function, uh, if your EV, EF decreases, your LV EDD uh, increases, or if you have any signs of wall stress during exercise uh, or congestive heart failure symptoms with exercise, those are all indications to operate. Um, I was consulted one time uh, a couple years ago on a, on a cirrhotic patient. Uh, they said he needed uh, aortic valve surgery in order to get his liver transplant. So they wanted me to stand by and do his aortic valve replacement uh, as soon as the liver became available so they could do a combined uh, AVR liver transplant. He was totally asymptomatic, had uh, severe AI. Uh, so I, told, I had to go to the liver committee uh, to get them to go ahead and clear him for his liver transplant, even though he had severe AI. He got the liver, everything went great. About three years later, we, we uh, replaced his aortic valve. So uh, aortic stenosis, just because it's severe, is not always an indication to operate. So the natural history, this is kind of why the natural history, if you uh, have mild AI, you pretty much have a normal lifespan. Uh, moderate, you can uh, have a, a, a 15% mortality at 10 years, severe with symptoms, 25% uh, at uh, five years, 50% mortality at 10 years. By the time you start getting, by the time your LV starts to fail, when you have a, a low EF and severe uh, symptomatic AI, uh, there's a 50% mortality at one year. So you can see the difference of, of kind of a slow, uh, um, not very dangerous situation when you have moderate AI. Uh, 
uh, but by, by the time it's severe and your EF is dropping, um, your life expectancy goes way down. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit to aortic stenosis, which uh, we, we uh, see more often. Um, the common etiologies of aortic stenosis, we see a lot of patients with bicuspid valves. Uh, throughout your careers as a surgeon, you, you may see a couple of patients with uh, unicuspid or tetracuspid valves. Uh, the toilet seat uh, valve is a unicuspid valve. Um, acquired uh, diseases of the aortic valve that cause aortic stenosis include uh, degenerative, rheumatic, again, uh, bacterial <coughs> endocarditis, and then a number of other uh, uh, causes of inflammatory uh, aortic stenosis. And this is what the bicuspid valve looks like. Uh, part of the problem with fixing the bicuspid valve is, uh, is the irregular shape. And uh, the, you can see with uh, two leaflets instead of three, the opening area is not as, as large and you, get, uh, you will have turbulent flow. Ultimately, the, uh, the leaflets begin to fibrose and then calcify. And you have calcium buildup and uh, over the years, by the time they're in their fourth and fifth decades, uh, most often patients start to develop aortic stenosis. So this is just a little pathophysiology of aortic stenosis and uh, a, a lot of these things uh, kind of play off each other, but basically with, uh, with, when you have severe AS, you're uh, beating against an increased afterload uh, and you may have 100 millimeters of mercury uh, peak gradient um, and so your, your heart is, uh, is trying to contract against a very high resistance. It's almost like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger lifting weights uh, and building up the biceps. He can't straighten his elbow anymore, so the muscle doesn't relax very well. Uh, you get LV hypertrophy. The LV hypertrophy will uh, ultimately uh, lead to de uh, reduced contractility, uh, leads to a diastolic dysfunction because the thick muscle can't relax very well, uh, which can lead to heart failure. You also increase the LV muscle mass, uh, which increases the systolic pressure. Um, increase, you get an increase in the diastolic uh, pressure and uh, prolonged systolic ejection uh, time. All of these things lead to decreased, uh, um, decreased, uh, I'm sorry, all of these things lead to increased oxygen consumption and myocardial ischemia. At the same time, because of the LV hypertrophy and the increased pressures, you're decreasing your uh, coronary perfusion pressure. You get compression of the coronary arteries and decreased coronary artery perfusion. So the combined effect of uh, decreased supply and increased demand uh, leads to myocardial ischemia, even if your coronary arteries are completely normal. So the symptoms, uh, a lot of, sometimes patients can be asymptomatic. Uh, they can have angina even without any uh, coronary artery disease like we just talked about. Uh, patients can have syncope because they uh, can, uh, because of the high pressure gradient, they may not be able to get the blood flow to the brain. Um, you can have congestive heart failure, uh, sudden cardiac death is a little more rare, uh, but you can also have arrhythmias, GI bleeding, uh, systemic emboli uh, can occur as well. So the grading scale, uh, the aortic valve area um, measuring in, in centimeters squared, um, if you have uh, an aortic valve area of uh, less than one, it's uh, considered severe. And there is a, uh, the natural history, there is a predictable uh, decrease in the aortic valve area over time, and typically the aortic valve area decreases by about 0.12 centimeters squared per year. Uh, the transvalvular gradient increases by about 15 millimeters of mercury a year. Uh, and so by the time you develop, you, by the time you have severe AS and you've developed symptoms, uh, you have about a two to three year average survival. Um, by the time, if you have heart failure, it's less than two years. And so, um, the natural history of aortic stenosis is a little bit different than AI, um, and patients kind of fall off the track pre uh, much more quickly. So you really have to watch these patients closely to make sure uh, that you're uh, getting them to the operating room uh, in time before they fall off. And this just shows the natural history uh, proportion alive uh, over years after the diagnosis of AS here uh, and AI here. So you see you've got a, a lot more, a longer latent period from AI, but uh, both of them can, uh, can fall off with a high mortality rate uh, quickly once they start to lose compensation. So the guidelines, um, HA, ACC guidelines for aortic valve replacement in AS, uh, 
if you have severe AS um, with an aortic valve area less than one, um, mean gradient greater than 40 millimeters of mercury and a jet velocity greater than four uh, meters per second. Um, the class one indications uh, for AVR according to the guidelines are symptomatic patients with severe AS. Uh, patients with severe AS undergoing cabbage or other valve surgery um, and even if you have moderate AS and you're undergoing cabbage, you ought to consider doing the uh, aortic valve at the same time because in, within a couple of years, you're probably going to be in that severe range. Um, if you have asymptomatic severe a aortic stenosis and any evidence of, of LV dysfunction, that's an indication that for surgery as well. And this just shows the latency, the latent period of the AS. Once they get symptoms, they kind of fall off that, that curve pretty quickly and you want to intervene quickly. Um, surgical sur uh, survival from AVR versus medical therapy, uh, you can see there's a pretty good p-value here. Uh, you get much, much more benefit from uh, surgery than medical therapy. <coughs> and uh, the event-free survival in patients who, are, who have asymptomatic AS based on exercise results, if you have a positive exercise stress test, um, your event-free survival goes way down. Uh, so once, once you start having uh, signs of stress, even if the patient is absolutely asymptomatic, uh, they benefit from intervention. Uh, the survival after AVR is uh, age-related, uh, so you can see the uh, much more rapid drop-off in the patients over 75, uh, but even patients over 80 uh, get a benefit from AVR versus medical management. There's a huge patient population out there that has severe AS that's not being treated. Uh, we're chipping away a little bit at that with the, uh, with the TAVRs for, uh, for patients who are high risk, uh, but we haven't gotten there quite yet. Uh, treatment options for severe AS, whether you do a, a, a if you have severe symptomatic AS, uh, whether you do a surgical AVR versus TAVR, uh, we know that there's a benefit for extreme risk and even high risk has a benefit for TAVR, uh, but the intermediate risk is uh, um, is still being determined. The FDA has approved uh, TAVR for intermediate risk, but surgical AVR is still the gold standard, um, and low-risk patients are under cl clinical trials right now. Um, we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, tissue valve versus mechanical valve, we're going to talk about that in some detail. And uh, surgical approach, if you're going to do uh, surgical AVR, whether you do a, a full sternotomy, a mini sternotomy, right intercostal approach, um, the operation's pretty much done the same way. So we'll keep questions for the very end. Uh